Flooding in southeast Michigan officially declared a disaster. How much will it cost to clean up and what does it say about our infrastructure in Michigan? Plus the debate over charter schools and accountability in Michigan and another delay in Detroit's bankruptcy. It's analysis of news across the state. My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining us. The big news this week, big flooding in southeast Michigan. Freeway shut down, roads crumbled, homes flooded. The governor officially declared a disaster in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties. How do we pay for the cleanup? What does this say about our infrastructure going forward? We'll talk about it. Plus, the debate over charter schools in Michigan and accountability just weeks before the school year is set to begin. Also coming up, bankruptcy trial delayed. We'll tell you what it means. And state-run Belle Isle's six-month checkup. It is all coming up for you on my week. And we do start, though, with the flooding aftermath. Questions on cleanup, funding, and infrastructure. So let's get started, and let's get to our my week contributors. Nolan Finley, the editorial page editor of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson, the editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. I know they call this a hundred years rain, but man, we <laughs> have, have a never, swim here today. <laughs> I, I mean, you've never seen anything like this, but thankfully the freeways are pretty much they're back Let's open again. It. Now rain's better than snow, right? I, yeah, Is I it? So. I Is think it? so. It goes away quicker. Well, uh, the snow would have turned into water and done the same thing, right? It wouldn't have melted. Well, let's, let's let's not look at the, the, the <laughs> hypotheticals of which natural disaster I would rather have rain. <laughs> is uh, is even better. But let's go ahead and and take a look at kind of the timeline and how this all happened this week. The governor waited a couple of days before declaring disasters in these three counties and was getting a little bit of, a little bit of heat from the people who were living there. Do you think he was right to be cautious, Nolan? Well, yeah. I mean, you've got to assess really what the damage was because you know simply. Uh, Flooded freeways and, and, and some ruined cars do, doesn't necessarily make a disaster. I think you had to wait and assess the damage done to homes and to the infrastructure. I mean, that's not something you want to just jump out first day and say, gosh, it's a disaster. You, you've got to assess because, again, rain's different. You don't know what the true impact's going to be. But everyone looks at this, Stephen, and says, how much is this going to cost to, to clean up and to shore up? And where does that money come from? Well, I mean, it'll have to come, I, presumably, from uh, the, the, the people responsible for the freeways, right? So that's state money uh, for the most part, I think. Um, there's some federal money that, that, that pays for, the, for those roads, too. But the state high, you know, highway funds, which are already uh, really hurting, I mean, we don't have tons of money uh, for that, and we couldn't get uh, bills passed to get us more. Now we've got another big, uh, big problem. You know, first it was the potholes from last winter. Now it's the damage from this storm. I mean, how much actual damage was done here to to the freeways? I think they're still assessing they're that. They're still assessing I think they're that. still trying well, right. to figure that out. You can't right. put freeways underwater though and not have some uh, long-term long-term damage. It may it won't be like the potholes. It won't be nearly as extensive and probably not as expensive. And how, fixed, but how do you tell? They were pretty much demolished before the rain came. I mean, by the potholes, yeah. By the, by the conditions. I think the issue is long term is what it's always been and that's infrastructure. I mean, whether we had rains or didn't have rains, we had an insufficient uh, infrastructure here. We've got aging sewers, particularly uh, in Metro Detroit. We've got aging roadways. And, you know, we keep putting it off and keep putting it off. And then, you know, something like this happens. I mean, four inches of rain in, in 20 minutes or whatever that was, I'm not sure any infrastructure could have handled that. But clearly, the pumps were stripped by, 
by copper thieves, and, and we've done nothing of substance to deal with that. The bill that passed in the legislature last year was so watered down by the industry, it means nothing. So you you continue to have people stripping out copper from water pumps, from street lights, et cetera. Uh, we haven't invested in fixing our sewers because, you know, that's underground, nobody can see them. Uh, and, you know, we put that worry off for another day and we haven't invested in our roads. So, you know, this is, these are all consequences of our lack of uh, attention to our problems. So I, I think you can say that no system would have been able to withstand that amount of water because it was such a historic rainfall. But because of the patterns and the weather patterns that we've seen, I mean, the lodge floods every once in a while when we yeah. get like a hard rain. Right. Um, so what do we look at down the road saying that we could be faced with more of this? We had a historic winter and yeah. whereas we had, you know, massive problems then with the roads with potholes and there and now we have this this rain. What does the area need to do? What does the state need to do? And then regionally in terms of having that political conversation, where's the political will and the money to tackle that infrastructure? About, well, it is about money. I mean, we don't spend enough. Uh, either through taxes or through uh, uh, fees for, for things like water, which pays for our sewers, um, uh, to take to take care of all this stuff. Uh, this is an this is an aging city. Uh, lots of cities around the country dealing with this have old wooden sewers uh, in places like Baltimore that are having to be replaced too. They get sinkholes there all the time. The road just collapses. Uh, into the sewer beneath it. Um, this is a, a big deal problem uh, nationwide and we have a, a remarkable piece of it here because we've disinvested so badly. Um, I, I, I think it's a very tough sell. I mean people people have been have become so accustomed to reflexively opposing new taxes, new fees because they don't think uh, that's the way things get fixed, um, that, that it's almost impossible to bring it up without getting that backlash. And we saw that this spring with the road bills. Uh, those were very sensible proposals. There were lots of sensible ideas put on the table. You couldn't get any of them done because lawmakers feared uh, that they'd go home and have to run uh, for re-election this fall and, and voters would punish them. And rightfully so. I mean, voters, voters are opposed to tax increases. Voters don't feel undertaxed. Um, what they do feel is that the money they've already spent sent to their government isn't used very well. And I think that's a very legitimate concern that government's going to have to address because there is no trust in government. When you see, every day pick up the newspaper and read stories of government waste and inefficiency and then you go out and ask taxpayers, oh gosh, we need another billion. Well, but I mean, there's, a, there's an ignorant strain to that too. Mm -hmm. There is waste. Uh, well, there's waste in anything. There's waste in in, in the private sector too. Government's not not find got, waste, a, got a monopoly. Find waste to the level you had in the Detroit Water and Sewage Department. But and then you're asking people, oh gosh, now you've got to pay more because we wasted the your billions here's over the Here's the years. problem: you cannot account for the disinvestment just with waste. Eliminate the waste. We still aren't paying enough to take care of these no, things. but you—that's why and, you have no trust in the, well, in the I, I, that this new money will be. So so the here. lack of trust, which which translates into dangerous and in this case right. deadly uh, infrastructure problems is somehow justified uh, because of because of because no, of uh, but you can't you can't sit here and put all the blame on on taxpayers for not is wanting on, to kick in more money when they've seen so much ma waste what I'm 80 saying percent is of their of, of they're they're overemployed by 80 percent in that water department and you're telling also people not true you've but, got to you know, it has been that's been you. that's been repeated over and over it wasn't actually okay hang that on one number. second hang it's on. their audit that Nolan, wasn't that Nolan, wasn't I want to step back I want to step back gentlemen and take this more to the state level and mm -hmm. and and bring back to something that you said where people don't have trust in the way that their money is being spent at the state level when mm -hmm. we're talking about roads and, and infrastructure sure. but I think that we saw through the spring and early summer that there was a groundswell of support of people across Michigan who would pay a little bit extra for yeah. fixes for their roads because of what they had just come out of in yeah. the winter time and, and the condition of the roads. Will we see because of this, I mean, catastrophic for many people yeah. event, will we see a change of heart in saying, you know what, we do want to pay more for that infrastructure that we don't necessarily see I, on the I ground? Think it, when you're talking about the infrastructure here, you're talking about uh, the water and, and, and sewer, uh, which it is a huge mess. I mean, they're, they're, that department has not been well managed in a really long time. And uh, I think everyone can the agree way on that, that. Right. The way that it's structured so that every city is only responsible for 
its own little part of this and that they, it's not really a regional system. Uh, that's part of the problem. Uh, the rates, the way the rates are set, uh, things like that. We've, we've got to rethink that whole thing. Now, is there, a, is there an appetite for that? I don't know. Uh, you saw in the bankruptcy, we couldn't get to a, a space where uh, all the counties could agree on a way to manage the system together and spread the responsibility and the liabilities across the region. That's what we've got to do. We've got to start thinking of these things as everybody's problem as opposed to your problem or mine. Yeah, but you've got to fix the shortfalls first. You're talk talking about spreading the liabilities. One of the reasons the city of Detroit finally started cracking down on people who weren't paying the bills is to make this regional authority more palatable for, for suburban well, communities sure. who didn't want to take on the responsibility of paying uh, Detroit's unpaid water bills. Mm -hmm. You've got to fix that first before you're going to get any sort of right, and that's, of, of that's spreading a of step liabilities. in the right way to uh, step in the right direction to get the mm -hmm. the uncollected uh, portion of of bills from DWSD right. collected so that you can do that. But you also still have to sell people on the idea that this is a collective problem, uh, that that this is a collective system that we are all affected by what happens in it and everybody's rates are higher because of the way that but we do it and the system is in worse shape but you, because of uh, uh, because we don't take care you've of got it. to convince some people that it's not it's going to be run well in the future it's not you're not going to have a, someone like Bobby Ferguson come in here and and steal and, Fair enough. and conspire with a mayor to spend tens of millions that destroys trust and people aren't going to blindly reach in their pocketbooks and say oh well I trust you'll fix that well and there's You've also got to show be, them it's been fixed there also has to be some forward thinking about how we can set up this system right. uh, you know 10, 10 20 years down the line yes. that adjusts for climate change that adjusts for changing conditions sure. and, and different right I mean the, you call this you call this a hundred year uh, uh, event but we also just had the worst winter on record uh, just four months ago I mean whatever whatever you want to say about whether climate change is uh, real or whose fault it is, the truth is we are having more extreme weather events, uh, not just well, in this region, but everywhere, and, and that, you got to adjust the, for and it. And the studies don't bear that out either, Steve. Sure I mean, they do. We're going to have an eclipse they do. next <laughs> month, Penny Penny. The sky doesn't mean the world's ending. Oh, I mean, weather happens. Gosh, I can't but, believe but you said been, that. But there, there, there have been massive, there have been massive variations that they've been able to There always has been. No, there haven't. Why did we just have the, we said the worst record. The insurance industry says claims for catastrophic events, no worse now than they've ever been. But the, the, the intensity and the frequency of unusual storms and weather events is, is increasing. I mean, for you to sit here and... Last time, we haven't had uh, a, a major hurricane hit since Sandy. So it's not like it's we're getting... Sandy, that's, that's what, that's three, three years, years ago? ago? We're not that's getting not pounded three long. and four times a year, Steve. All right. It's weather. Well, all right, well, we're going to have to... We'll definitely be still talking about this uh, in, in the next uh, weeks to come and good luck to many people who I know are still cleaning up uh, cleaning out their basements turning out of charter schools and debate this week in Lansing at the Michigan Department of Education the state superintendent announced 11 out of 40 charter authorizers are at risk for suspension because of quality and transparency issues also this week the board called for state lawmakers to step up and pass legislation that would prevent management companies from also being the charter schools landlord they want to set clear standards on who can open charters. They want to hold authorizers accountable for academic performance and then require private management companies to publicly post that same information like salaries that public schools post among many other things. Now all this leads to some confusing conversation. Is some of this already covered under state law? But first let's take a look at the authorizers singled out for possible suspensions and when you look at this list of 11 out of 40 I mean you have some of the largest authorizers in the state and some who have been also pointed out as some of the most successful successful authorizers, including Grand Valley right. State. And it was interesting, I, you know, I read a quote this week from them saying, um, we definitely want to be in compliance, and once we figure out what those metrics are, we want to make sure we're in compliance. And my question is, why are we still trying to figure out what the metrics are that they're being that they're the being tested The state's done a yet? bad job of, of managing this, and that's the whole point. The state has done a, a poor job of holding uh, the, the, this, this this system of schools accountable the way that that it should uh, and so you've got to have clearer metrics clear consequences there should be more review upfront of authorizers before they open schools to determine whether they're 
you know, quality uh, operators or not. Uh, these are all very basic uh, quality control measures that should have been in place 20 years ago. They aren't in place now, and it is the state's responsibility to step up and do it. This list looks like it was put together by the MEA, and I think this is a union-driven attack on charter schools. When you talk about holding charter schools accountable, the state hasn't held public schools accountable. Why but would they be But that's the worst argument for not Why holding be charter schools. Here? That's the worst argument ever for not holding charter Hold schools all accountable. schools Fine. accountable. Fine. Do it for all schools. But what's the... But, but we're not, Steve. No, but... The, and so the, because and we're Grand not, Valley we is one of the we most should successful. let the charter Hang on, charter. let Nolan finish, yeah, and then you get to jump in, and then you have to stop talking when they, he starts. Well, Grand Valley is one of the most successful charters in the state. Excellent schools. They're saving children's lives and they end up on this list. I mean, I think this is part of an overall attack by this school board, by the way, which is elected by the MEA. It's a they're elected ongoing by the attack. Voters. Elected by the voters. It's, it's, they're funded by the MEA. They're um, ongoing attack on charter schools. They still can't get over the notion that parents need choice, particularly in places where the public schools have failed and they're failing all over the state. We have, okay, we have, Stephen. We have more choice in Detroit than we do in any school district in America and, and the schools are and the on, schools Nolan. are not any better than they were than they were before the school the choices for the most and uh, you know I'm a parent in Detroit and have to have to sift through these choices I'm telling you 90% of them are junk 90% of them you wouldn't send your child to, uh, and I wouldn't send my child to. And that includes the public schools, that includes the charters, that includes the EAA. It's a failure. There's no question it's a failure. There are a few exceptions in Detroit uh, of, of high quality charter choices. And those, those should be celebrated, those should be expanded, we should grow the model. But you also have to deal with the failure of these other schools. And I don't care whether you deal with it uh, in terms of all schools uh, or, or, I mean, why would you pick out charter schools and not public schools? I think that that's a great question. But the worst argument in the world is that we shouldn't do more to hold charter schools accountable because the public schools aren't. The public schools we know are failing. So uh, why should, that's not the measure. The measure should be what we were told charter schools were gonna do, which was one, provide quality alternatives, and two, they were going to make the public schools better. John Engler sold that all across Michigan, that this would, this would fix systems like Detroit, and it hasn't. Nolan. Well, charter schools have done great things in Detroit and have given a lot of kids an opportunity to graduate and get an education. You send Who your kids to the school other, there? Do you send yours to the public school or I don't. School? I absolutely don't. I send my kids, I wouldn't send my would kids to most to of leave, any of them. Would you be able to live in Detroit without that charter school? I Absolutely, I would. I was raised in Detroit and I didn't go to a Where charter school. Where would you send school. your kids? I would send my kids, well, first of all, the best school in Detroit is a public school around the corner from my house. So th th there's no question that that's the, that's the model we ought to be we ought to be looking you, okay at. I think we need to get beyond the conversation of our charter schools good or bad they've been here now for some 20 years good, now we need to we need not. to elevate the conversation to do we need these do we need new laws in place does the legislature need to step in and start tweaking these things Absolutely. will they make put, those schools more effective all the more we that's, put, the, that's the conversation we put many now. of these new laws in place already in 2011 there it's working and the charter authorizers have been shutting down bad schools unlike the public school system which never shuts down well bad but, but what the, what and the I new think the charters are very, much more responsive to their parents uh, and to the parents who choose to send their kids there Stephen. what what we're not doing is uh, front-loading the accountability right we let just about anybody open a public school or a charter school uh, and and you can go across the you can go across the street from me in Detroit and find this Horace Sheffield uh, was operating a, a charter school You're for a long time on poor little chef well I, I'm just saying you know look there are lots of examples of poor performing schools that are just allowed to, to will to these recommendations it. from the Michigan Department of Education change that I that's they, the question I think they are a start I think I think the one the one pushback that's right here is we ought to be talking about holding all of the schools accountable under the same system. I don't think charter schools should be singled out and treated differently. I think they ought to be treated the way every school ought to be treated, which is exactly. you have to perform or we come in at you know this idea of closing versus uh, remediation is another issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why not try to make the schools better uh, before you start, t uh, start talking about shutting them down? But this idea that somehow uh, charters have delivered some miracle 
that uh, that we should all be thankful for is preposterous. There I are live more in a quality city, schools in Detroit today that's because not, of that's charters untrue. than there were 20 years that's ago. That's actually untrue. That's, that's because the public schools not. were better 20 years ago than they were now, and you've had more choices. And they would be worse without charters. They, uh, they uh, would because they would have never <laughs> paid attention to they the, are to worse today than they to were 20 years ago. There they are would have fewer been, options, and that was a long-term. Let Nolan finish. But even before there were charters, Steve, they were those schools were getting worse. That's why charters came. They started That's charters, charters as a way to, to make those schools better. Name they a public started school. Started charters to give parents a choice who were trapped in these failing not what schools. We were told. Schools that were failing for we generations. We were told, and schools. we were told that that choice would introduce competition in the market that would make. And it did that would make public schools better. All right, I'm going to round this towards the end of the conversation because we could talk about this for five hours. Name I a know. public school I that's know we better could. No, hang because on. of charters. Hang on. That's not so, the charter's so, fault, So hang on. Steve. So let me, hang on. <laughs> so here we go. So now the legislature, when they come back, they are looking at now these recommendations from the Michigan Department of Education, people who are going to school, the kids going to school in the fall, people who go to these charter schools and public schools who are watching this. Nolan, what can we expect? Can we expect any action from the legislature? Well, I don't think the legislature is going to be railroaded by this school board into shutting down the charter school movement. Well, I they're think not talking about you shutting Hang on, Stephen. You may get some, <laughs> some reasonable changes to regulation, most of which is already in place, but I don't think you're going to get a wholesale, they're not going to mount this wholesale attack on charter schools that this school board wants because they recognize this school board is inherently hostile to charters. Okay, that's your last word on that's that. All, last, I mean, wor last word on this, Stephen. That's a lot of rhetoric. The truth is we need to, we need to do a better job of controlling who opens charter schools and and dealing with the ones that are open and making sure they perform and that their financials are public and managed in a in a reasonable way I think the legislature is poised to do that uh, probably before the election all right let's uh, move along we've only got a couple more minutes left in the show two things I want to get to real quickly another delay in Detroit's bankruptcy trial judge pushed the hearing over the restructuring plan back to August 29th it was supposed to start next week uh, does that signal anything Stephen, let me start with you. Well, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, they they put some new adjustments to the plan and yeah. Sincora, which is, you know, it's now all focused on Sincora. And Sincora asked um, for more time for discovery, yeah. some more information from the, uh, from the city. I think what it does is give them just this little extra time, another couple of weeks, to negotiate a settlement this. Nobody really wants this to go to trial. Because if it goes to trial and then it goes to appeal, this could be a five-year process. So I think you know they're they're trying to to um, give as much time as possible to reach a settlement with Sincora, the um, the bond yeah, insurer I, in this I, mess. I feel like there is no possible settlement with that particular uh, creditor. I mean, I think uh, they, they're so dug in and and they are so exposed. I mean, that that's the insurer I think who's stands to lose the most, particularly from the grand bargain. Um, uh, yeah, and if there's and that's nothing what their more, objection is to. So, I, but if the if the city has nothing more to give, you know, I, I just don't know what they think, what more they think they're going to get. Well, but I mean, to your point, they're probably going to go bankrupt here if they accept this settlement. They so may. What's their what's you know, why not fight? Why not keep why fighting? Why not keep it? fighting? All right, well, we'll keep watching it. We did want to talk about um, Bell Isle and six months under um, under state, uh, being state run, but we'll have to talk about that another week. We're out of uh, time already. I know, we're out of time. We Can you believe it? Our show from Bell Isle. <laughs> and that is going to do it for my week. I'm Christy McDonald. Thanks so much for joining us. If you want an extra My Week fix starting Friday, August 15th, our show will be rebroadcast every Friday morning at 9 on WDET Public Radio 101.9 FM. So a big welcome and thanks to our new listeners. Listeners. Find us at myweek.org for any shows you might have missed. Plus, we are on Facebook, Twitter, so follow us at MyWeek. For Nolan Finley, Stephen Henderson, and everyone here at Detroit Public TV, I'm Christy McDonald. We will see you next week. Take care.